Before we uh, dive into the scriptures this morning, I want to give you a little bit of an update on uh, one of our missionary families. Um, Tony, if you'll throw up the picture. Um, that is uh, Abner and Katie Contreras and their kids. They serve in uh, Antigua, Guatemala. Uh, Abner is the youth leader and um, the worship minister at a church called Iglesia del Camino. Uh, Mountain View Church has had a relationship with them and with that church now for several years. And they are a precious, precious couple. Uh, I've tried along the way during my first year here to get at least some contact with all of the missionary families we support. And this past week, I had my first opportunity to do a FaceTime call with them. And we talked for about an hour. And I just got to hear their story, got to hear what some of their needs are, and got to pray with them. And y'all, they are a precious couple. Like, have you ever met somebody and talked to them and felt like after the conversation that you knew them for years? It felt like that. And I am so grateful that we have the partnership in the gospel with them that we do. And they know that we're praying for them today. And so I hope that the Spirit of the Lord will encourage them as we do that on their behalf. Just a few particular needs, if you'd like to write these down, that you can pray for in the coming days and weeks. First of all, they've, they've got some pretty significant financial needs right now. In fact, they've got a friend who has uh, launched a fundraiser for them on GoFundMe, and they're taking donations for that. And, the, uh, and all of the one-time donations given up to $2,000 will be matched. And so we're going to put a link to that GoFundMe page on our Facebook page one day this week so that as you prayerfully consider uh, what the Lord might have you to give, you might be able to help them. Uh, Abner uh, is in need of an MRI and possibly surgery on his knee. They are driving a 1996 <coughs> Nissan Pathfinder on roads that are not very good, and so they could use uh, a better vehicle to get around in. So those big needs kind of make up the bulk of what they're trying to raise money for. As far as other prayer requests, uh, you can pray that the Lord would encourage them. Uh, they told me that this past year has potentially been the hardest year they've ever had in ministry together. And so they're uh, not only facing financial needs, but just facing discouragement and what they feel like are uh, just continued spiritual attacks. So if you'll pray for the, the, the Lord to encourage them and uh, perhaps uh, to use us as a church in more ways than just by giving finances, but to partner with them and encourage them in the gospel. And then if you'll pray uh, for their protection, not only over their family, but over their church and their ministry and over the partnership that some of the pastors in the area have with one another. They told me, and I had known a little bit of this, but they, they told me that there's a lot of corruption um, in uh, Guatemala among government officials and police and things like that. There's also a lot of drug activity. And so they're just asking that the Lord would have his hand upon continue to watch over those that they minister to as well. So I want to pray for them, and uh, if you'll join me and join us this week um, as we seek to do that, I'm going to offer a prayer for them right now. Father, we do thank you for Abner and for Katie, for their family, for their ministry in Guatemala, and for our partnership in the gospel. God, they're there, we're here, but Lord, we share your Holy Spirit. We share the very blood of Christ coursing through our spiritual veins. We are indeed family. And Lord, we share a common cause and a common mission in seeing the gospel go forth, in seeing people come to Christ, and in seeing people become like Christ. So for these dear, dear ones who are on the front lines, we pray for them today. We pray for Abner as he leads worship at Iglesia del Camino. We pray for the youth he ministers to. We pray for the folks that he works with there at that church, for the various ministries they have in that city and in surrounding areas, that you would cause them in 2020 to be fruitful ministries for your glory. And Father, we pray also for them, that you would strengthen them during this season of discouragement. Lord, send believers not only to provide for their needs, yes, that, but God, more than that, to build them up, to remind them, Lord, that you care, that you're concerned, that you see, and that you want to uplift and uphold them. 
And God, for their physical and financial needs, we do pray. God, for Abner's potential knee issues and the need for an MRI and for potential surgery, for the need for a new vehicle. These are incredibly specific needs that we lift to you. And God, we ask you to provide. We ask you to do what only you can do. And by that, to also encourage this precious couple. Let them know that your care is not just for their spiritual needs, but for their every need. And God, use that. Use that provision to build up their faith and to reestablish them in the work that we've called them to do. And then finally, God, we do pray for protection. You are the God of all creation. You are the God above all principalities and powers. And we acknowledge that this morning and ask, we ask that your hand would be upon them and that you'd keep them safe so that they might continue the work you've called them to do. Thank you this morning for the great privilege of praying for these, our partners in the gospel. We, we say all these things, we mean all these things, we give all these things to you in the name of Jesus who is our Amen. Amen. So as I said at the beginning of the service, my wife is in Florida at Universal Studios, and she took our oldest with her, which means I was left at home with the two youngest and a puppy. <laughs> and for me, this weekend has been all about endurance. <laughs> all I got to do is make it until I put them down to bed tonight, and hopefully, magically, she will reappear in the morning. Just to show you what endurance has looked like for Dad this weekend. On Friday night, <clears throat> we were trying to decide what to have for dinner, and I said, I can make you mac and cheese. And both the girls were like, fantastic, that's awesome. And so I went in the cabinet and I started to look for the noodles and there were no noodles. And I said, there are, are spaghetti noodles, so I can still make mac and cheese. <laughs> that's what I did. I took the spaghetti noodles and I broke them all into little tiny pieces. And then I made mac and cheese out of spaghetti noodles. What I found out is they don't actually stay on a fork. When they're that small. So the girls had to endure eating the mac and cheese that I made. Well, yesterday rolled around and I said, What can I do for breakfast? I thought, We're just going to go to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so that's what we did. And then lunch rolled around and we made it for lunch. I mean, that was hard. But then it was dinner time and I was going to grill us some burgers and I said, now nah, I'm gonna let Chick-fil-A take care of that. So we went to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and so now my girls assume that today dad's just gonna take them out to eat, which I will. <laughs> it's all about endurance, right? Well, we've been in this series in the month of January called Resolved. And the whole idea behind the series is to highlight some things that we as believers need to resolve ourselves toward as we walk into 2020. We began by pointing to Matthew chapter 11 and Jesus' words there about resting in Him. And I encourage you on the very first week of this series to resolve yourselves to rest in Jesus this year. We moved on from there to Psalm 46 where we talked on week 2 about taking refuge in Christ, about resolving to find our hope and our help in Him when we face the fears and the unknowns of the future in front of us. And then last week, we talked about being resolved to rejoice. Resolved to rejoice, in fact, when things don't work out like you hope they will. Because guess what? There's a whole unknown year in front of us, and I can promise you that some things won't work out like you hope they will. Well, today we're going to round out that series by talking about what it means to be resolved to run with endurance, the race set before us. Resting and taking refuge and rejoicing are all bound up in our ability through the presence of the Holy Spirit to run this thing called the Christian life, this thing called the race of faith with endurance. And so it seems like an appropriate place to close out and culminate this series. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, verses 1 through 3. And so if you'll turn there, we're going to dive in. 
The writer of Hebrews begins chapter 12 this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Consider who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. The central command of the passage that we're going to be in this morning is let us run. Let us run with endurance the race we've been given, looking to Jesus the whole time, who is the author, the perfecter, the cause and the completion of our faith. Only as we do that will we be able to run what is often a difficult race with endurance. In fact, if you just look at the passage, I think it's safe to assume that the Christian life, this race of faith, is not always an easy one. In fact, there are all kinds of challenges, all kinds of ups and downs. There are valleys and hilltops. There are canyons and there are mountaintops. There are things to avoid, challenges to overcome. This thing called the Christian life is not always pleasant. In fact, it does require endurance not without its challenges. At times, in fact, you and I may wonder if it's worth it. Things can become so difficult on this road of faith, so difficult in this race called faith, that you and I may question whether or not in the end following Jesus and remaining faithful to Him from beginning to end is even worth it. That's why, in fact, the author of Hebrews begins the chapter the way he does. It's why he points to this great cloud of witnesses, these people almost seated in the grandstands cheering us on as we run the race that they've already run and completed. Now, who are these witnesses? They are all of the Old Testament saints that the writer of Hebrews outlines in Hebrews chapter 11. Some of you may be familiar with what there is called the Hall of Fame of Faith. Let me just highlight some of the names that are mentioned there. If you'll go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. The writer of Hebrews says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, and reverent fear constructed an ark. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he would receive as an inheritance. Verse 9, by faith, Abraham went to live in that land of promise. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah received power to conceive even when she was past the age. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham again, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son by doing that. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac. Verse 21, by faith, Jacob. Verse 22, by faith, Joseph. And on and on and on through to the end of the chapter. So that when we come to chapter 12, verse 1, and the author says, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, what does it mean for them to be witnesses? It means that in their death, they now bear witness to the fact that everything they trusted God to be and to do, he did. In other words, what they could only at the time see through a glass darkly, they now see face to face in the person of Jesus who is the fulfillment of all these promises. God has fulfilled everything He promised these Old Testament saints who waited and waited and waited. And He's telling us here in chapter 12 that Jesus is the one they were waiting on. He was the one that they were believing in, though they could only see from a distance. He is the one, according to Hebrews, who's greater than the angels, who's greater than 
Moses, who's greater than the Old Testament, greater than the law, greater than the prophets, greater than the priests, greater than all the temple sacrifices. He's the beginning and the end of faith. He is the one who, no matter what he walked through or went through, was most faithful each and every step of the way. These Old Testament saints, though they often stumbled along, and though their faith was often very small, yet they trusted. And from beyond the grave, what they say to us now when we read the Old Testament, and we read not just of their faith, but of the faithfulness of their God, they say to us, you can trust me. You can trust him. And so the race that he's given to you to run, you can <clears throat> run it in faith because God is faithful. That's what they say. You know, those who have run the race before us, some of whom, if you go back and read Hebrews chapter 11, <coughs> suffered terribly for doing so. They tell us that in the end, it'll be all worth it. Remember what I just said. They have now seen face to face the one they hoped would come and they can tell us even as the living word speaks of their faith to us that it was all worth it. Hebrews 11 says they died receiving not the answer to all the promises made. In fact, those answers came to we who live on the other side of the cross and the resurrection but they still testify to the fact that those promises have been fulfilled because guess what? They are in the presence of Jesus. And they see Him face to face. So at times you and I wonder, we may wonder whether or not this race of faith, this endurance thing called the Christian life is worth it. They are here to testify to us through the pages and the stories and the Psalms and the books of the Old Testament that it's worth it because He's worth it. And because he's worthy and faithful. The writer of Hebrews here also says that along the way, you and I may find ourselves weighed down with things that hold us back and tangled up in sins that trip us up. You know, there may come points along the way, in fact, there probably will come points along the way, that you're not only tempted to throw in the towel, to wonder whether or not it's worth it, there are going to come points along the way where you're trying to carry too much stuff with you and you can't run like God wants you to want run because you won't lay it down. Whether it's good things or sinful. And the author of Hebrews says here that we're to lay aside every weight and the sand which clings so closely so that we can run with endurance. What does it mean to lay aside every weight? Well, in the athletic world, okay, this was, <clears throat> this was a word that meant any excess body weight that needed to be removed. Now, a couple of things there. It could have been weight that needed to be removed before a race through the right kind of cloak, right kind of training, or it could have been the weight that needed to be removed through excess clothing. Yes, that's right, my friends. In the Olympic Games of yesteryear, and in the Isthmian Games that took place in court, the athletes ran naked. Oh. Yeah. And so there's a reference to that here. When the author says, we who are followers of Jesus are not to walk around naked, okay? Let's be real clear. Everybody got that? Do not leave here and walk the streets of Murphy and say, Pastor Mike told me to do this. <laughs> okay? No, no, no. The author of Hebrews is saying that like the athletes who want to participate well in any sport, you and I need to undergo the kind of necessary training to lay aside any weight that's hindering us from running the race well. In other words, get rid of every hindrance. The purpose of making their body into the very best athletic body it can be. Paul took this whole analogy and he brought it right into the spiritual realm 
when he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, listen, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Translation, there is a discipline aspect to the Christian life. Now it's not a discipline aspect that you and I bring about or accomplish in our own power. No, it's, it's a power given to us by the Holy Spirit to discipline ourselves to run the race without hindrance. But it does require often laying things down in order to move forward in freedom. How many of us, by the way, actually see the Christian life as a distance race for which we must train if we're to endure to the end? Here's the reality. If we did, then I think we would have a much easier time leaving behind things that hinder us than we probably do. If we did, I think a simple question would probably suffice to help us determine the things that help us and the things that harm us in this race. Does it get in my way? Or does it help me run? <clears throat> Whatever it is, good thing, bad thing, Pleasant thing, harmful thing. Does it get in my way or does it help me run? Now keep in mind here that we are talking about sins. The author of Hebrews addresses sins which cling so closely and we'll deal with that in a minute. But we're also not only talking about sins, we're talking about those things which weigh us down and they could be good things. But they're things nevertheless that keep us from running the race as those who are fit and ready to do so with endurance. I think John Piper has it right when he, when he says, don't just ask, what's wrong with it? You know, this question has got <coughs> into my skin this week, and it's caused me to really think about some things. He says, don't just say about your music or your movies, about your parties, about your habits, about your computer games about your relationships. Don't just say what's wrong with it. Don't just ask, is it a sin? That's about the lowest question you can ask in life. I'm going to do it if it's not a sin. So tell me, is it a sin to do this? Well, not exactly. All right, that's all I wanted to know. I'm off to do it. The better question says, does it help me wrong. Does it get in my way when I'm trying to become more patient, more kind, more gentle, more loving, more holy, more pure, more self-controlled? Does it get in my way or does it help me run? That's the question to ask. You know why that question isn't very often asked? Piper says because we are not passionate runners. We don't want to run. We don't get up in the morning saying, Lord, what's the course today? What's the course of purity? What's the course of holiness? What's the course of humility? What's the course of justice? What's the course of righteousness? What's the course of love? What's the course of self-control? What's the course of courage? Oh God, I want to maximize my running today. If you have that mentality about your life, then you will not ask. How many sins can I avoid? Instead, you'll ask, how many weights can I lay down so that I'm fleet-footed in the race of righteousness? <clears throat> totally different questions. Totally different questions. <clears throat> but there are those sins, right? There are those sins that stick so closely to us that we need to rid ourselves of. That's what the author says. If, if we're going to run with endurance, it's not just about laying aside those weights that hold us back. It's about laying aside the sins which cling so closely to us and hold us down. What we could call sticky sins. Sticky sins. 
You know, sin so easily entangles us. And once you give into it, it sticks. It sticks. It clings. We have to be intentional about ridding ourselves of it. The old Puritan John Owen wrote these famous words, Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Exactly right. Profound words and a bold reminder that sin has the power to hinder our progress in the faith. So as you and I examine this passage this morning, my prayer is that the Spirit of God would use this passage to examine us. Is there anything in your life right now that has you tangled up? Some sinful attitude or, or habit that seems stuck to you like super glue <coughs> that you've just not been able to shake. Maybe there's a deeper question. Do you even know you're stuck this morning? Some of us don't. Some of us have gotten so deep. Some of us are so mired in sin that we don't even know we're stuck. Like we're treading water and it's more like treading quicksand and we're sinking, sinking, sinking and we're trying to run but the harder we run, the further we sink. And we just don't know that sin has us tangled up and stuck. Do you realize that your ability to run the faith, race of faith is being hindered because of those sticky sins? The author of Hebrews says that we need to lay aside that sin that clings so closely. Now, truth be told, sometimes you need help getting untangled. <coughs> sometimes you need help. Sometimes you don't know you're tangled up. And sometimes you don't realize that your ability to run the race is being hindered because of sin in your life. One of the reasons God has made us part of this family, part of this bond, is that we can help get one another untangled. Paul writes in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, meaning you who are filled with the Spirit, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So here's the picture. Okay? What, if, what if the church were a place where those caught in sin were not looked down on as less than, but were gently approached and gently addressed about the things in their life that are, that are harming them and not helping them with a view not toward shunning them, but toward helping them get back in the race. What if, what if that was our MO? What if we looked at everybody around us within our church family who's called up in any kind of sin and we thought, man, I want to I I help them prayerfully and humbly get themselves untangled from that so they can run all out for Jesus. of the church as a hospital. Now that has to exist alongside the vision of a church as a gym. The vision of a church as a training place where together we learn how to run the race of faith with endurance as we are trained up together in keeping our eyes on Jesus. But the, the people who make up the church need both if we're to run the race set out for us with endurance. Now along the way, as you and I run this race of faith, we might be tempted to think it's not worth it. We certainly will encounter various trials and we'll be tempted to take things along with us that we should put aside and we'll get tangled up in sins and hindered along the way. But the reality is, and this is a reality that's spread throughout the book of Hebrews, and it's one of the reasons the writer to the Hebrews is writing to them. You and I may at some point or another be tempted to actually give up. 
One of the challenges the Christians he was writing to were facing. Were they going to go back to their old way of life known as Judaism? Or were they going to continue on with Jesus trusting that no matter what they went through, it would ultimately be <coughs> worth it? And you and I will face times like that too. And the reality is, if we are going to go the distance, the core of this passage, says that we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. It's one thing thing to put away hindrances. It's It's one thing to look away from entangling sins. It's an entirely other thing to say, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. But that's what the author of Hebrews says. He says, let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter. What does it mean that Jesus is the founder of our faith? <coughs> Jesus is the one in whom faithfulness and faith reach their perfection. All the faithful in Hebrews 11 are just followers. Jesus is the leader. He's the supreme example of faith. He lived a life of total and complete dependence upon his father. In other words, he's the trailblazer. He's the one who shows us at the end of the day what it actually looks like to live by faith. To run the race by faith. And to trust that God has in mind for us good ends no matter what we go through. But Jesus isn't only the beginning of faith, he's the in the perfecter of faith. He's the trailblazer who having gone ahead of us and having completed the course that God had for him was raised from the dead, exalted to the right hand of the Father and is now seated there cheering us up. But more than that, in his resurrection life and through the gift and power of his spirit, he's empowering us to run the race to completion as well. It's like Paul tells the Philippians, what God began in you, he will finish. Jesus is the cause and the completion of our faith. The beginning and the end of our faith. And the writer of Hebrews tells us here that Jesus himself endured. Notice the word twice in relation to Jesus, in verse 2 and in verse 3. Now, what did Jesus endure? Think about it. Instead of fleeing when things went south for him, what did he do? He stood his ground. Instead of faltering in the garden on the night of his arrest, when he was overwhelmed with sorrow at the prospect of the cross, he remained Faithful to the race that his father had set before him. The race his father had called him to run. He held fast. He held firm. He held on. And get this. The writer of Hebrews says, He endured the cross despising its shame. Meaning that he held firm even to the point of the public disgrace of execution by crucifixion. There was perhaps nothing more shameful or disgraceful in the world at the time. And on that cross, as Jesus died in public and open shame, his last words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. To the very, very end, He held fast. And he held fast in faith that though he died alone, absent from his father, and his father still died. And his father would still receive him into his presence. That's what it meant for him to endure the cross. But the question is, how did he do it? The writer says that he did it via the joy that was set before him. 
In other words, he was able to endure. He was able to undergo the public humiliation of death by crucifixion because he kept his eyes fixed on the joy that was ahead of him. And what was that joy? The joy of resurrection after crucifixion. The joy of exaltation after humiliation. The joy of glory after suffering. The joy of the crown that would follow the cross. The joy of the presence of the Father after the awful absence endured. The joy of our salvation through His sacrifice of love. Those things held Him there. Those things held him there. Because he looked forward to all that awaited him on the other side of it. And here's the secret, friends. You and I will be able to endure also as we keep our eyes on the joy set before us. And according to the writer of Hebrews, that joy is not a what, it's a who. Not a what, it's a who. He says, run the race that's set before you with endurance, fixing your eyes on Jesus who awaits you at the finish line and will embrace you even if you collapse into his arms when you get there. <clears throat> Having completed his race, he sat down. That's significant. It's significant because it means that it's all done. And that as we run, we can actually rest in Jesus, knowing that the end has already been determined if we are in the end. <coughs> knowing that His resurrection life empowers all who trust in Him to run the race before we even start and to run it with endurance, anticipating the joy before us which is coming all the way home to him. Brothers and sisters, this is how the Apostle Paul was able to endure. Listen to his words in Philippians 3. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now listen to what he says. Not that I've already obtained it or am already perfect, but what I press on to make it my own. Because Jesus has already made me his own. Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it. But one thing I do. Forgetting everything that's behind. In other words, laying aside the weights, setting aside the sticky sins, and straining to what lies ahead, I press own toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You and I, you and I, will only ever be able to endure if we keep Jesus in front of us as a joy. But look at what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 3. He says, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Consider him as just another way of saying, look, fix your gaze upon Jesus. But it's meant to remind us that fixing our eyes upon Jesus involves actually reckoning in our minds and hearts with his suffering. Looking deeply into his afflictions, to his broken body and his shed blood and the cross where he paid for our sins. And coming to terms with what he actually went through as a man of faith in order to purchase our salvation. And here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying in this verse that really just culminates this entire series, okay? You and I will only ever be able to endure as we keep his resolve in front. 
See, notice what the writer says. He says, keep Jesus in front of you so that you may not grow weary and faint. His resolve is meant to empower your resolve. His resolve is meant to show you that you too can endure because His Spirit dwells in you. This is precisely why we have to keep our eyes on Him. And that's exactly what the Lord's Son enables us to do. To keep our eyes on Jesus as the author and the perfecter Every time we come to this table, every time we take the bread into our mouths, every time we receive the cup, we are reminded of the sufferings of Jesus for us. We're reminded of his broken body and his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. We're reminded of how far he went and how much he endured to secure our salvation. We're also reminded of his endurance. That his food, as he tells us in John, was always to do the will of his Father, and he would not stop until it was finished. He would not stop until it was finished. This meal also reminds us that just as our bodies need fuel to function, so do our souls. If we're to run the race of faith with endurance, we need soul food. <clears throat> and I'm not talking meat and potatoes. I'm talking genuine soul food. Only Jesus can sustain us. And only by faith can we be sustained by Him. The beauty of this meal as a gift from God is that it is a tangible, tasteable pledge of His promise to sustain you. Of his promise through the presence of the Holy Spirit to sustain you with the very lifeblood of Jesus so that you can run the race with endurance. You see, this meal is not just about what you and I do in receiving these things. It's also about what God does in promising to always be for us and not against us. To always feed us on Christ so that we're sustained to endure the race. Even as we take this bread and this cup this morning, may we look to Jesus for every single thing we need to endure to be here. I invite you this morning to enter into a posture of prayer as we prepare to receive the elements of this table. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and to prepare. I'm going to ask those who are serving communion to come to the front and to get ready. Just a little bit of instruction regarding how we do things here at Mountain View, if you've never been before. There'll be two stations right up here at the front. You'll come down the center aisle and go to either the station on the left or the right. You'll pick up a piece of the bread and you'll pick up a small cup. You're welcome to take them, the elements, as you walk back to your seat. Or you're welcome to take them back with you and to prayerfully consider Christ before receiving and then do that on your own time. However you do it. Just remember this morning that this is a meal only for those who know the Lord Jesus, who have a living and vital relationship with him. If you don't know Jesus, don't take the bread, don't take the cup. Instead, take Christ. Take Christ and surrender yourself to him. Now let me say this. You may know Jesus, but you may be weary and you may feel faint-hearted this morning. You may feel like you're tangled up in a sin that you cannot get out of. And you may feel like you're burdened by a weight that you don't want to bear anymore. Confess those things to the Lord and come and receive from Him grace and strength and mercy and a beautiful reminder that He loves you. That He's for you and not against you. Let's pray together.